Welcome to Fish and Rice Stories from Japan. I'm your host, Toby, and I'm here today with Daniel. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, my pleasure. How are you? I'm doing really good. Yeah? It's good to be back in Osaka after a long time. Yeah, you yeah. currently live in Osaka, in, uh, not Osaka, what am I saying? You're <laughs> living in Yokohama and you're an Ikebana teacher. Yeah. Right? So we will have a lot to talk about Ikebana because we want to learn more about this. But maybe first, could you introduce yourself for our listeners? Sure. Where are you from and how did you get to Japan? Yeah, I'm Daniel Patterson and I've been in Japan for 18 years. Um, That's quite a long time. A little bit, yeah. yeah. I'm from Canada, the East Coast, uh, New Brunswick. So it's very on the ocean, maritimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I moved here in 2006 on the JET program. Okay. Um, and I spent the first five years in Shikoku in the prefecture oh, of Kagawa. Beautiful area. Yeah, yeah. I love Shikoku. And delicious especially udon. Kagawa. Yeah. yeah. Um, because of that, ramen's kind of ruined for me. Like, I like ramen, but udon's always going to be number one. Yeah, for me, it's soba. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so far is nice. Being in Kansai, yeah. yeah why um, did you decide to go like on a jet program and come all the way to Japan? It's it's a really funny story. It depends how you want to look at it. Um, if you look at it, um, like looking back, you can kind of create a story. But mm-hmm. it kind of just started, if you look back at it, um, from a friend in junior high school. Oh, that's um, okay. Yeah, so looking back and he wanted to join karate, but he didn't want to do it by himself. Mm. He was just nervous. He's like, can you come with me? I'm like, well, sure. Like, this sounds interesting. I'll give it a try. And we started, I think, the last year of junior high school. And then um, after we finished junior high school in that summer, a Japanese woman came and joined the dojo. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then through there, um, throughout the summer and then high school for me mm-hmm. and university, we became really good friends. I would help her with her English and help with essays and stuff. And she did the English ESL mm-hmm. and went on to do her sociology degree and then her master's in soci- uh, sociology. And then just through being friends, she got me really interested in coming to Japan. Um, and then she still lives in Canada and oh, she's teaching okay. at a university in Canada. She's teaching Japanese language and Japanese so you culture. Swapped, basically. It feels like that, really. Um, so growing up and going through it, um, you don't really think about it. But then when you look back and reflect, you're like, wow, like one person just comes into your life and changes the course of your life. Isn't it always like that in a way? It's yeah. like the, uh, I may say something wrong here, but electrons yeah. or neutrons that just bounce off each other and like, yeah, each other like we're, we're all atoms, so yeah. we're all made of the same stuff. And um, but yeah, just me and this one person. Her goal was not to change my life, mm. but just by being my life, it just kind of changed. And then through her, I got interested in Japanese culture. I was doing karate, and then when I went to university, I did a semester of the language. Mm-hmm. Um, and the teacher also did some culture workshops from her home. Okay, so I kind of just got prepared, and she's like, "Hey, why don't you try the JET program and go over to Japan for a while?" And I was like, mm-hmm. "Yeah, all right, why not?" Was a uh, Shikoku a destination you chose to go to, or did you want to go somewhere in particular? Well, you get kind of three requests. Mm-hmm. And Shikoku was kind of the third request because at first I requested um, Nagoya Aichi, where my friend was from, mm-hmm. just kind of want to be like near where she grew up. And the second request was in Oita and Beppu. Okay. Um, just because I was really onsen. cool with all the onsens. Yeah. And then I had a friend from Canada on the JIP program currently, and he was in Tokushima. So I requested Tokushima. Also in Shikoku. Yeah, mm-hmm. like right next door. And then I had none of those choices but my the one they gave me was Kagawa next to Tokushima mm-hmm. but I was really happy with the placement it was a very great place Shuko was awesome Kagawa were was you awesome. in uh, Takamatsu city or somewhere? yeah I was in a, a small town called Kokobunji mm-hmm. which became part of Takamatsu when they absorbed some mm-hmm. of the communities but yeah basically Takamatsu and then of course I uh, grew the love for udon <laughs> How was it for you when you first arrived? Uh, did you have any kind of culture shocks or was it like normal after having studied the culture a little bit and having uh, practiced karate and you just felt like, oh yeah, this is what it's like or were the things that really surprised you? I would say it was a little comforting because mm-hmm. I come from a very small place in Canada. Um, the province is less than a million people mm-hmm. and the city is less than 100,000 people. Mm-hmm. So Takamatsu was kind of comparable. So it was kind of comfortable um, there and of course things were different, but um, I was pretty okay. Like I'm a kind of person who um, just kind of sets up home and invites people. I'm mm. just kind of like that um, rock that helps support people. So I just set up wherever I go. So it wasn't too much of a shock. Um, of course, there's lots of things, lots of mistakes, and lots of things learned, but I wasn't too stressed about mm-hmm. it. Yeah. 
And you stayed there for the first five years. Yeah, I was in Takamatsu for the five years. And then I actually moved to Yokohama in 2011, two years after the Tohoku earthquake. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of weird because I had already made up my mind that I was moving to Yokohama. And then the earthquake happened and there was still the aftershocks. And then when I moved to Yokohama, it was a bit like, it was so strange because you know, the buildings had their lights off, the trains had mm. their lights off. So it was really right after. Off. Yeah, exactly. Like a week or two weeks right after it. Mm. So it was still aftershocks, um, people conserving energy, um, people still worried. So it was really interesting. People thought it was a bit crazy to move up to. Did you think uh, about canceling the move? Or? No, I really didn't. I was like, whatever happens is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I know a lot of people left Japan at that time. But I was just like, well... Whatever happens, gonna happen, mm -hmm. and I, this is what I want to do. Yeah. Why do you choose to leave Shikoku? I mean, it's such a beautiful area, and <laughs> you have a lot of it nature. Is it's a bit more calm, and you're moving to Yokohama, which is very close, maybe like entangled together with like very busy Tokyo. And was there a reason to go there? Um, well, one, the contract was finished, mm -hmm. and then two, I looked for job offers and in international schools um, because I was teaching kindergarten elementary junior high at mm -hmm. that time and through the jet program i actually discovered that i really love early childhood education kindergarten mm -hmm. so i had the opportunities up in yokohama so that's the main reason why i moved up um and then started continuing my career in education through here um and just to be more in a big city life so i love shikoku but it's definitely more convenient being up here mm -hmm. in yokohama and then i've from coming from my hometown in canada I've always been kind of near the ocean. So mm -hmm. cities like Takamatsu and Kobe and Yokohama, I feel very comfortable with. So throughout all this time, you've been working in education and teaching. How did the interest for Ikebana start? Again, it's one of those things where you can reflect upon and kind of see a story forming, um, or you can say it's just random. But um, plants and flowers have always been a huge thing mm -hmm. in my life since a child. Um, I hate winter and then I'm coming from uh, Canada where it's winter almost six months of the year mm -hmm. and it can be, be quite brutal. Oh yeah, so. minus 30, minus 40, two meters of snow. Mm -hmm. I hated it. And then the very dark days um, were just really difficult for me. So on the weekends, I remember in like junior high, high school, I would go to like a greenhouse nursery and they had a big greenhouses with lots of plants and you can smell the earth, they're very humid, mm. there's waterfalls, there's parrots around, ice cream, um, very bright. So I would go there on the weekends just to kind of recharge because having those dark long winters is really tough on me. Yeah. Um, so having the flowers in my life was very important. And then again, my family, we had gardens and stuff. So we've always been in my life. Um, and then I'd never consider myself much of an artist and like drawing, painting, never good at those. Like mm -hmm. stickman, that's about as much as I can go. Um, and then I would see Ikebana. I was like, that's really cool, but I could never do it. And then at my station, there's a department store and they had an Ikebana display set up. And I was okay. looking at that's really cool. And at the same time, um, a fellow coworker. At work, we were talking about it, and she said, oh, I really want to try Ikebana. I was like, yeah, me too. And she's like, let's do it together. So it's kind of like going back to... to the story is karate, exactly. right? Exactly. My yeah. friend who was nervous to try karate, I said, well, why not? Mm -hmm. And then my friend who wanted to try it, and I was kind of the nervous one. I was like, well, yeah, let's do it. And then um, I just kind of Googled Yokohama Ikebana English. And mm -hmm. then this one person popped up, and I had no idea about anything about Ikebana about the different schools and I just saw them and I was like, okay. And then I just booked a um, trial lesson. Mm -hmm. So that's how it started. It did, yeah. For someone who's listening and kind of hearing Ikebana for the first time or maybe knowing that it's related to plants and flower arrangements, how would you describe or define it? What exactly is Ikebana? I think going into it, I really had no idea, mm -hmm. uh, but now I know a lot more. Um, still lots to learn, but it is really just, um, I would say, becoming familiar with the plants and flowers and being observant and then bringing them to life. So the flowers are beautiful. Ikebana is putting that human aspect into the flowers and giving them a new life. Because once you cut them, they're disconnected from nature and they're very much dead. Um, and that's people will see that as a waste, but Ikebana is giving them new life. So being able to manipulate the flowers 
and putting your essence into it. And the flowers become human too. It becomes a part of yourself. So it's be creating an extension of yourself, basically. That's very interesting because it's a very deep answer to a question <laughs> where I, I was expecting something like the goal is to arrange plants and flowers according to maybe a set of rules uh, to create a certain harmony or feeling. Mm. But you basically phrase it as the goal or Ikebana or what Ikebana is, is giving life, new life to flowers. Mm -hmm. So it's not about doing something for the environment, it's doing something for the flowers in a way. It is. is. It's about the flowers and yourself. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of rules, lots of principles, lots of philosophies, mm -hmm. but in the, when it comes down to it, it's really an expression of you working with nature and nature working with you mm -hmm. and creating something new and beautiful and how that's going to affect other people and the environment. So today you're a teacher. Mm. You also yes. teach at the Sogetsu School. Is that correct? Um, I teach on my own, um, okay. my own business, and I also teach at an international school. Mm -hmm. And I teach the children there as well. And when it comes up with their curriculums, um, but I'm focusing on my own business and really enjoying that. Mm -hmm. Um, and the headquarters, they have lessons and seminars and all that, and they have teachers there. Uh, maybe one day I'll be a teacher at the headquarters. We'll yeah. see. They have an international class, so um, where they teach in English. So that might be my goal. That's <laughs> that's a good opportunity. Yeah. If we go back now, though, to the very first lesson, mm -hmm. you were a bit afraid to sign up, and with your coworker, you're like, okay, let's do this together. Um, how did it go? What did you do in that very first Ikebana class? Um, I, the sensei um, was really nice. She speaks mm -hmm. English and Japanese and a bit of a mixture. Um, and from what I remember, just going over the basics. Um, and it's very much the teachers will hand you the textbook, like a photocopy of the first lesson. And you read it and go over the, the basics. And she'll tell you or the teacher will tell you some of the philosophies mm -hmm. like the Shin Soe and Hikai and what they mean. And they just let you go to it. And then... It's very much you'd make it and then they correct you. Um, it's kind of how things work in a lot of the Japanese learning. Learn by doing. You learn by watching and mm. doing and they'll correct you after. Um, but I just remember because we love flowers. We don't really touch them too much, to be Interesting. honest. We look at flowers. We appreciate flowers. Mm. Sometimes we'll put flowers in a vase. But do we really touch them and bend them? Um, so I was working with, I think, tulips and there was branches, maybe peach branches, because it was around February, March. And um, but yeah, just working with the flowers, cutting them and bending the branches. It was like this circuit that was broken, mm -hmm. but then reconnected because I never thought of myself as artistic. And I did horrible in art classes, horrible drawing, painting. None of that was my forte. Um, but then I just felt this connection happen and then immediately fell in love in that trial lesson. What are, so you mentioned some concept that the teachers would teach uh, or share with you, mm. like Shin Sui. Um, what are the basic concepts that uh, people should know about Ikebana when, if they ever look at a uh, flower arrangement mm -hmm. that is done professionally, um, what are things that we can consider as a viewer and be like, okay, if it's been arranged like this, the person who did it thought about this part and this part and this part? I think it really depends on where you're at when it comes to understanding um, mm -hmm. Ikebana and flowers. Because some people will see um, Ikebana arrangements. There's some that are more natural and more some that are more refined, that are more modern. And people just need to decide what they're looking at. Um, but basically, if there's a high level of skill, it looks seamless. So they could be one flower just masterfully made and it looks simple, but there's a lot of practice and knowledge behind that. So mm -hmm. making something seamless is actually very advanced. Um, for Ikebana, it's not just putting flowers in a vase. That's kind of um, over the Western. Yeah, it's West. That's kind of like the Western flower arrangement mm -hmm. with um, Ikebana. It's more of a spiritual and philosophical you know, Japanese philosophy, um, and you're thinking about there's the God aspect, whatever you believe in, there's nature and there's the person, and finding the balance between those three. Mm. And Ikemana focuses more on space and line and color. Um, so the end result may not be beautiful, like a full bouquet of flowers, but it'll definitely be interesting. Um, so the focus isn't necessarily on beauty, but like what form can you make and what can you say and convey with that? 
Where did where did it all begin? Like, what's the origin of Ikebana? Um, it really began um, with the Buddhist monks, and it was very seasonal at that time. Mm -hmm. And because back then there was not that technology to grow flowers out of season, and so it was really the flowers for the gods and paying attention to the seasons. Mm -hmm. So it really started there, and then from there, it moved on to the military class samurai, and oh. it became. Um, male only like a lot of things that started as male only and then it went kind of very in fad for there and then it trickled down to the commerce merchants and the um say the aristocrats the high-end mm -hmm. um, rich people <laughs> and then it became yeah. very popular and then during like the meiji restoration area era um it became very popular with women and then it goes through that phase because um, I play the harp as well mm -hmm. and again it started as a male only and switches to female and then it's like trying to find its balance between male and female same with Ikebana now it's done by me sorry male and female um, so it just goes through that so it just trickled down starting with the monks became popular with the military mm -hmm. then the merchants and then with the uh, regular people and so today it's used a bit here and there Uh, we regularly see it, for example, uh, maybe in temples. We see it. Yeah, always in temples, for mm -hmm. sure. There's always still the flowers. Um, and it's surprising where you will find the Ikebana. Often in hotels and mm -hmm. cafes. Maybe some office reception areas. Yeah, I know, I know an Ikebana artist um, here in Osaka, actually. He regularly does it for a dental office. Oh, wow, um, okay. He does lots of exhibitions for hotels. Um, car shows, um, I've seen that. Um, And fashion shows as well. I, there's one artist in Tokyo who I quite like um, who does headpieces, Ikebana headpieces for wow. the models. And that's a part of the fashion show. So it's really everywhere. And with the philosophy and just in Japan, like flowers are just a daily part of life. Mm -hmm. And then even looking, um, it's been inspiration all over the world. Like I just watched maybe Star Trek The Next Generation a couple years ago in mm -hmm. the entirety and I just noticed in the background there's a lot of Ikebana really? in the show because maybe at that time in the early 90s that looked alien or foreign um, I just was like wow there's actually a lot of um, flower arrangements in that show in the background if you look at it how can you tell if uh, if you see this kind of arrangement this is has been done following one of the philosophies of Ikebana um, I think there's very much an easy difference to tell between a uh, Western flower arrangement where it's just a lot of flowers that look very beautiful mm -hmm. and it's just there to be beautiful. And then um, with Ikebana, you can tell there's a lot of um, thought and expression that mm. goes into it. You'll see where the space is created, the lines, you'll see movement and you'll see someone trying to convey a message. Um, and just reflecting because Ikebana really changed over the time and especially with Sogetsu Ikebana um, It's supposed to change with the time. So it's just reflect you reflect what's happening in the world reflect the space that you're in um, So the difference between just a vase of flowers to something that will maybe speak to you and say something Can you tell us maybe a bit more you mentioned now that so you learned the Sogetsu from the Sogetsu school and kind of follow this philosophy of Ikebana. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly is it and how does it differ from other schools of Ikebana? Yeah, there's um, many, many schools of Ikebana. Okay. Uh, Ikenobo is probably the most traditional and that's the one that would be followed down from the temples mm -hmm. uh, from the monks. Um, so gets is 104 years old now this year. Uh, we're having our exhibition at the end of the month. Wow, nice. And um, in Japan? Yes, and um, Nihonbashi Takashimaya. Mm -hmm. I'll be participating. And um, for Sogetsu, it's very modern school since it's so young. I mean, 100, uh, 100 years is <laughs> but, but not comparatively, so young. it's pretty young to yeah. other schools of Ikebana. So for I can't speak to the other schools. I don't know their philosophies very well, um, but. Um, for Sogetsu, it's quite modern with the fact that their motto, the philosophy is anytime, anywhere, anyone, um, anything. That's so very, very modern. It is. Right. So um, for the creator of the Sogetsu school, um, he grew up being very traditional and then he broke out at 25 years old, broke out and created his own school of Ikebana. Mm -hmm. And maybe it had to do with scarcity of flowers after World War II. Um, but any container will do. So we could use this mug, um, we could use a broken glass, 
Um, so there's lots of beautiful vases, but any or container the head. will do. The head, yeah, or for sure. Yeah. Um, and coming away from the container gives a lot more freedom as well. And then um, using flowers, branches, anything. But in Sogetsu, you can use um, anything you want. So often in exhibitions, you'll see people using forks or a, I've seen a bicycle or or a um, exhaust engine from a car. Wow. Um, so it really is that philosophy. So it's very modern, very expressive, and it's supposed to really reflect the times that we live in and who you are and what you're trying mm -hmm. to express. Um, so that for our school, it's very modern and very interesting. After you've had your first class then, and you kind of got a first taste for, mm. okay, this is Sogetsu Ikebana, this is, um, these are the basics. What made you want to continue since you said you're not so much of an artsy person and not uh, why did you want to continue and i think it was that taste for having that feeling of i can make art mm. um because so that was accessible. very powerful um because my mother very artistic <laughs> that did not pass mm. down to me <laughs> at that time for whatever medium i had but it was an it was an ability to be able to express myself mm -hmm which I never had before. So it was a new medium to express myself. So I think that's what really continued it and just to see where I can go artistically. And then um, since I'm a teacher, I've always been a teacher and I love teaching, naturally I was like, oh, well, I really want to learn this and I really want to be able to teach this to other people. I want to be able to share this with other people. But really just diving into how to be creative, how to express myself. And there was a lot of... Um, you know, there was a lot of reflection and sometimes struggle uh, because you have to learn all the rules, but then learn how to express yourself. And then sometimes expressing yourself can be very scary. Yeah, because you're yeah. kind of sharing uh, something ab about yourself. Yeah. Right? And, and you're not sure if, how it's going to be understood. And, uh, and yeah, that's the great thing about art and Ikebana mm -hmm. is that you will make an arrangement and you decide what you're expressing. But you definitely have to be open to how other people see it because people will see it very differently um, and people will resonate with it differently. There'll be a different message for people, but that's a beautiful thing. But you definitely have to be open to criticism. And luckily for me, I'm just like, yeah, that's really great. That's that's what you see. Uh, if someone says I don't like it, I'm like, well, that's all right. It's not for you. Mm -hmm. um, have you, you ever like had it. like a, these, this moment where uh, you've created a piece with something very specific in mind and you've exhibited it and someone made a comment about it, not necessarily negative or anything like that, but completely unexpected where you're like, mm. oh, wow, this is kind of what you see in this arrangement. That's interesting. Why do you see that? Oh, yeah. It happens all the time. All right? the time. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I just go, oh, well, what's really interesting? Like, tell me why. And I try to see it myself. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. But um, I think with Ikebana, you just kind of have to... Um, let it go because Ikebana is very fleeting. Um, a lot of, um, I would say, Westerners and foreigners who don't know too much about Ikebana, they always say, oh, you make it, but then take it apart. Or like, you make it, do you sell it? I'm like, well, no, um, it only lasts like in the summer for three or four days because it's so hot and the winter lasts longer. Um, but I don't make it and sell it. I will go to a location and make an arrangement for that business mm -hmm. um, or make it at someone's home but it doesn't last forever and yes. that's okay but that's a hard concept for like especially my friends and family back home like oh you make it but then tear it apart um well, do you, nowadays you can take photos yeah so it's great that you can take photos these days and so that's how we kind of be able to reflect mm -hmm. and grow and also keep those and you know have that memory but um you just have to have like the wabi sabi of it and just let it go um just kind of with flowers too um, you can't be afraid to cut flowers and cut off leaves because mm. you can love nature. And a lot of people are really terrified to, you know, cut a flower off. They're like, oh, that's a waste to like cut a leaf, cut a branch. But you have to realize like reducing it um, brings more beauty to it, really, with the minimalism of Japanese philosophy. Mm -hmm. You said that one of the challenges of uh, making an arrangement is uh, the rules you have to kind of mm. follow. And at the same time, when you explain Sogetsu, uh, you uh, phrase it as it's a uh, Ikebana you can do anywhere, anytime, mm -hmm. by any means, with any container. Um, what would be some of the rules uh, to follow that need to be respected for it to be following under this kind of Ikebana yeah. arrangement? I mean, definitely like one flower, one leaf, which kind of means 
um, one flower, one leaf can embody all of nature mm -hmm. and just use what you need. So it's really, if you have too much, maybe your ikebana is going to look ugly. Um, and then just by paring down and going to the very basics, use only what you need to express yourself and express what you're trying to make. That's when the true beauty really forms. And so there's different levels. You can have a really natural, wild ikebana or a really refined one that's very manicured mm -hmm. or somewhere in between. And you just have to judge that um, between the space and what you're trying to convey. And then you have the philosophies of like space, line, color, mass, um, one leaf, one branch. Wow. And there's a lot to internalize. And it really becomes what you can see. So over the years of practicing, it's really about developing your sight. And it's not just your sight with your eyes, but also with your heart. And then, you know, you have to use your judgment. So it's really developing that, which is um, fine balance between many mm -hmm. things. So what? how do you start when you, you have a project uh, let's say I would like you to make an ikebana arrangement for this table here. Mm. Um, do you start by drawing it? Do you just visualize, look around the space? What are the colors here? What is the atmosphere here? And then what's your process for making um, I think for me, um, one of my weak points is drawing for sure, as mm -hmm. I mentioned. Um, and having able to sketch your arrangements is a big asset and that's something I'm working on. I plan on taking some classes mm -hmm. on drawing to learn the basics and get better at that. Um, but for me, it's mostly done in my head. So I will take a look, what's the um, vibe of the place? And like, what, what do people feel? What kind of room it is? And what do people do in this room? I look at the colors, I look at the space available mm -hmm. and I just kind of get a feeling and then I'll we'll get a form in mind and then I'll decide on the flowers based on the colors around. And again, for this space, I want to, because there's two microphones here, I probably want to keep it confined within this space and use the triangles that are formed here mm. and use the space behind and work within those confines, but make it flow within and have a movement. Um, so there's all those things that are in your mind. And some people do sketch it down and bring it to life. And some people will think about it they'll start making it and halfway through they'll see the form they're trying to make and they'll change their minds. And that's okay because Ikebana is ever changing. Even mm -hmm. if you do a sketch, um, it's okay to change it. So it's very much being in the moment and it's really important to take a step back, look at it and don't see with just your eyes, but see with your heart and again, just look at the perspective. So it's really important to take a step back and look at it while you're making it often. Mm. So there's a lot that goes into it. And you have a limited time because Depends, yeah. you, your, your flowers or plants may or may not live long enough if you just <laughs> overthink it and I change mean, again and again. Within a few hours, it's pretty okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but you don't want to handle the flowers and materials too much because yeah. they'll start to get weak, um, depending on the stems of the flowers. Um, so, you know, you do want to be, don't want to change your mind too much, but allow yourself to be flexible. Are there uh, rules regarding which flowers and which plants you're allowed to use? And are there some that are not allowed to, use, to be used in Ikebana for uh, traditional reasons? Or I think that really depends on um, school to school. Mm -hmm. And then when Ikebana first started, before it was even Ikebana, um, it was very seasonal and it was very much there to celebrate the gods and the seasons mm -hmm. and the festivals. And it still is. Um, we have certain flowers like for the girls festival there'll be peach blossoms and for the boys festival irises for the tanabata the star festival we use bamboo so mm -hmm. we do still have all those flowers for the different seasons mm -hmm. and we and it's very important to have a theme for ikebana and then sometimes the theme is for festivals um, sometimes the theme could be for an event and then sometimes the theme is just the materials itself and that's enough as well um, so before is very much attuned to the seasons, but with technology um, and with Sogetsu Ikebana, it wants you to move forward. So we don't have to pr um, stick to the seasons. So you can have materials that are out of season together, um, but it is important to have a theme. And um, we do celebrate the seasons and occasions, but just having the flowers itself to bring kind of um, that life and energy to the room is reason enough. How, how does it work if you, for example, 
Sogitsu seems to be very forward thinking and you just mentioned mm-hmm. you you can use things that are maybe not in season or not meant for that event for that event as long as you manage to create something that has a message mm. within a theme yeah um, but I can imagine as with many traditions there will be some schools that are more how can I say like purists or more traditionalists oh, yes, yes. into mm-hmm. no this is Tanabata you have to use bamboo mm-hmm. Are there um, kind of debates uh, between schools and masters of Ikebana about which direction they should go and what is allowed and not? Or the, do they leave each other alone? Basically, to the best of my knowledge, um, mm-hmm. the schools, we do kind of stick to their own philosophies. And we do have exhibitions together. Mm-hmm. Um, just a few months ago at the Yokohama Takashimaya, there's an exhibition with different schools of Ikebana. And you just kind of just try and appreciate because you can see very much that these each arrangements from a different school maybe you don't understand exactly what the philosophies are but you can say like oh that's very different from this one um it does say the school in each one but you can mm-hmm. tell like oh I, when i look at something I'm like oh that's sogetsu um i look at this like that's not sogetsu or that's ikenobo and we don't really have clashes because we have our own schools of philosophy um i would say a good rivalry is nice yeah um, sometimes we have these uh flower battles and there was one a beautiful, like a competition. Yeah, there's a beautiful one in Yokohama and Yamate, maybe about six years ago, the last one I attended. And it was amazing because I was still a beginner, very mm-hmm. much a beginner back then. But watching different schools of Ikebana go off against each other and they had to make arrangements in five minutes, it was That's amazing. And so there time. would be like Western flower arrangement versus Sogetsu versus Ikenobo. And they have five minutes to make something. And it was just fun. It was how, really how can good. you even judge anything like that? Because then it, it's just <sighs> comes down to the, everything can be beautiful, right? And it can, it, yeah. Depending it's on very, how you look it at it. It is subjective, but yeah. um, I think you can tell in your heart which one you like the best. <laughs> but um, mm. but um, just what they can do in five minutes was incredible. And I still probably can't do that in five minutes, what they could do. Um, but I would say that each school just keeps to themselves and... Of course, we cooperate with each other, try to understand this, each other. Mm-hmm. Some people do go into different schools of Ikebana as well. A lot of people started in maybe just the regular uh, flower arrangement, the Western style, and move mm-hmm. into Ikebana. Um, I see. So people will have different experiences and put those together. And you just uh, mentioned a keyword here, experience, right? Mm. You, uh, for people to make this in five minutes for a competition <laughs> or even to... To be able to visualize, like you said or suggested, between the two microphones and user space and the mm. colors uh, to play with, a lot of it comes down to experience, right? You need to have seen a lot of Ikebana. You need to have done a lot of Ikebana to mm-hmm. be able to, to visualize, oh, I can take this idea from you and this idea from you. Yeah. So if, if you're new to this, it must be di- very difficult at the beginning to even, okay, I ha- what do I do with this? I would say everyone's experience, including myself, after your first lesson, even your first five lessons, Ikebana, you feel very overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Um, but you just kind of have to trust your sensei and trust the process. Um, and the more that you learn, the more comfortable you'll feel. Um, failing is very important. It is okay to fail. It's okay to make a bad arrangement. And again, with Sogetsu, you can have beautiful flowers, but not necessarily a beautiful arrangement. Mm-hmm. But it can still make a big impact. Um but at the same time, sometimes you really just do mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> and your sensei will fail you. And you just try again because you you only learn from mistakes. Um, and it is just through that experience and repetition um, that you do that and become more comfortable. So it is a long process. Mm-hmm. Again, um, going through Ikebana, my goal is to be a master someday. And there's many student levels, many teacher levels. And it is, it's a long process. And there's a reason for that because you have to train your eye your senses and you have your confidence really and your judgments we recently had a a guest on a podcast sharing her experience with us about tea ceremony Mm. and um, she also mentioned that uh, although she's reached certain levels of knowledge in tea that she's allowed to teach certain aspects of tea ceremony as well um, there are still many many levels above and masters Mm. will keep secrets of uh, very special techniques with very special tea that can be used for this occasion only mm. and you need to be at a certain level before they will share this with you is it similar in ikibana as well where um, some techniques some flowers some events are reserved only to masters and if you want to get there you first need to go through every step um, before 
I think it's a little different. We don't, um, as far as I know, they don't keep secrets. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Maybe I'll find out later. Secret book of Ikebana. (laughs) Um, It's a little different. I think it just comes from, again, the training your eye and experience and know what to, when looking at an arrangement, know what to keep and know what to cut away. Mm. Um, So often when I'm teaching and there's new students, they'd love to put a lot of flowers. And I just cut maybe a branch away. It opens up the space and they go, oh, wow, that looks really different. And And the way you open their eyes to it, right? Yeah. And Mm. same with me. That's how it happened with me. When I first started Ikebana um, and my personality, I was like, more is more, bigger is better, like go big or go home. And (laughs) big bouquet. Oh yeah. Like lots of flowers. And then meeting my first sensei, like she was very minimalist, very modern. One flower, one leaf. Yeah, exactly. And so it was a big learning curve for Mm -hmm. me and it was really great for me. But again, it was a challenge at the very beginning because I always want to add more. But really, the expertise is taking away and making impact with as little as you can. And so that was a huge lesson for me. What was the turning point for you when you realized uh, you want to be a master one day? Where it was not just, oh, I, I want to try Ikebana. Do you want to try this with me? And you, oh, this is fun. And then, oh, actually, I want to take this seriously and I want to be a master one day. Well, I think that, again, my personality is like, um, go big or go home. And, you know, I've had a lot of refinement from that. But when I fall in love with something, I tend to want to be the best and go as far as I can. So I would say probably after a year or two of learning Ikebana, I was Mm -hmm. like, well, gosh, like, I really love to teach this. Like, what if I move back to Canada? I love to be able to teach this to other people. This is a passion that's formed in my Mm -hmm. life. So... Um, and actually led to like a career switch of being from mainly education to balancing education with Ikebana. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was very much go, like uh, moving up the ranks of from teacher and head teacher and principal and stuff like that. But then I was like, oh, my passion is really Ikebana. So I changed careers and then have more of a balance and then more focus on teaching Ikebana. And then again, going through many levels, there's five different textbooks you go through for Sogotsu Kabana, and then you move up into the teacher levels and then the, your sensei decides when you move up. Mm-hmm. So it's just very, it can happen at any time. It depends on, you know, how you're working, how well you So there's you're no doing. exam or... Um, for the final two certificates, there's an exam once a year at the headquarters, mm-hmm. but until then your sensei promotes you. Um, and it just goes on your learning and how you're doing and how you're reflecting upon yourself and how your sensei feels. And so I have three teaching certificates now, but mm-hmm. there's five more to go before I become master. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's still a journey and yes. I, I look forward to it. Um, but I think when I fall in love with something, I really just go as hard as I can. And so it wasn't a big stretch for me to want to become a master um, and dedicate a good portion of my life to be doing that. And then I love teaching, no matter what the subject is. So it was kind of natural after a couple of years. Like, oh, I really want to learn this. I really, really, really want to be a teacher. Mm-hmm. And I expressed that to my sensei. And of course, as soon as I expressed that, I was very early on, probably by the end of the first year. She's like, all right, but I'm going to be really strict on you. Mm. <laughs> and, and she was. And it was hard. But I really appreciate that because um, in the end, it makes you a better teacher. You really have a, a very <laughs> obvious passion for teaching. And so I was wondering if we talk more about that for a moment. Yeah. Um, how do you approach now teaching uh, Ikebana? You said you do it at schools as well. So yeah. I imagine uh, you have maybe younger students. Uh, is this something they're interested in at all? And how do they understand this uh, maybe century old tradition where you bring in a, a, a modern aspect of in it and they are maybe in school and they don't want to be arranging flowers well i find um i've taught from young as three years old to adults well for ikebana and what i find for children is that they want to be with nature and they want to play with flowers and we are not concerned so much with the rules and philosophy but their creativity and just observe what can they do with flowers because children um no matter their age um they have, this, they have this creativity and this creativity is not combined with a fear of failing mm-hmm. or a fear of making mistakes. So it's this unbridled creativity that sometimes adults can't have. So just watching them and see what they can do with the flowers. When they get to a certain age around 
you know, eight, six, seven, eight, year, nine years old, you can introduce some philosophies. Um, I recently taught some grade two students and over the years I noticed, well, they're really afraid. Again, we like to observe flowers, smell them, watch them, but mm -hmm. working with them, um, they're scared to bend them and break them and cut them. So I usually start with the lesson with these flowers are dead. We've cut them. They're already dead, but it's our job to bring them a new life. And so just show them like, well, you can bend it this way, cut it this way. Don't mm. be afraid because they're dead, but we need to give a new life to them and express what we want to feel. And I just teach them a little bit about the philosophy and space and line and just let them go at it. And um, see what they create and you're not going to be very strict with them and say oh this isn't good you say mm. well this is wonderful I love how you did this and love how you did that but working with children they're automatically connected with nature um, one of the best compliments I ever had was from a student who would spend hours every day with Minecraft and tried a lesson um, through the school and tried with the flowers and they said oh, this is more fun than Minecraft I was like best comment ever wow. like i'm taking this to my grave <laughs> yeah th this <laughs> yeah. is quite a comment exactly so that natural that natural desire to be part of nature i think for humans because nature is part of humanity and humanity is part of nature we work together and then we have a love hate struggle with each other um that we work together so when we cut flowers it's our job um, to give them new life and to express. Because if you just cut a flower and put it into a vase, it's kind of destruction, kind of a waste. Mm. Um, but if you cut flowers and you think about it and you're mindful and you place it into a vase, that's giving new life, new beauty. And I just think that naturally children are very attuned to that. Um, as adults, we're a little more afraid, a little more timid because we are like, well, what if we make a mistake? Mm. What if we're wrong? What if I break the rules? So there's very different aspects between teaching children and adults. Um, but I love just seeing the connection and excitement that children get when working with flowers because they do love it and you don't have to tell them so much. They just go right for it. That's super interesting because I, I was leading up this question <laughs> with the assumption that, yeah. you know, younger children, maybe they want to play video games or they want to play sports mm -hmm. or they want to read manga or watch anime. Uh, but not uh, arrange flowers and actually they do enjoy it and they kind of go back to this very simple uh, activity of oh, this and this looks nice together I'll put them like that and just yeah um, and again it's regardless of gender as well the boys and girls they both love it and you'll have um, boys who are heavily into sports and minecraft and games but once they're introduced to that once they have permission mm -hmm. to touch the flowers and branches and they can bend it and you can say, do whatever you want. Keep this in mind, but do whatever you mm -hmm. want. They love it and they just go wild with it. And I've never experienced a child who is just like, no, I don't like it. Um, of course, they're not going to come if they don't want to do it. But I haven't had any child who's been like, no, this sucks. They just loved it. And they go home and they talk to their parents about it. And I've had the parents come and say, wow, like we want to do more and introduce more. Because I think that, you know, especially... If you live in a big city like Tokyo, um, Osaka, it's not so common to be in touch with nature every day. You can go many days or weeks without being in the forest. Yeah, clearly. Yeah. In this, uh, well, um, it's an urban jungle. Yeah. And um, I think that, that that's a connection that just can't be missed and that there's a craving there. Um, so you, it's something that people, maybe they don't know it, but once they see it and they feel it, they're like, oh, well, this is it. Is uh, t the teaching of Ikebana, especially maybe in schools, an activity that is growing in Japan? Do, do the school boards or the institutions that have the power to uh, implement this, uh, are they taking actions to kind of promote it more? Um, I would say when it comes to Japanese schools um, and junior high, high school, sometimes elementary school, mm -hmm. um, often elementary school too, um, they do have Ikebana Club. So it's still oh, very nice. much part of Japanese life mm -hmm. and for those who want to seek it. And then my background is more international schools. And they do, whether they have an in-residence Ikebana teacher or guest teachers that come to the school, um, they do try to incorporate it. So I think it's still a very much important part of life in Japan. Now, you've been doing Ikebana for... Uh, uh, it's been about eight years now. Eight years. Mm -hmm. 
Is this something that for you personally has kind of really changed your perspective on life in Japan and Japanese culture? I think um, at a multitude of levels mm-hmm. um, where I go back to saying like my my personality was like go big, bigger, more is more, like more is better. Mm-hmm. And then um, really just seeing what can you reduce it down to? And so I've just kind of become a person where people ask me like, oh, well, how do I decorate this room? Like, how can you see with your eye or what about this space? What we can do with this space? Um, when it comes to my cooking, I cook a lot and I always love to, um, even if it's just for me, present the food very nicely. Mm-hmm. How can I incorporate Ikebana into preparing food? Um, and again, just look at your life and say, well, do I need this? Um, is this important? Do I need it now? Um, so just really pairing back. So like the whole minimalism aspect to it, um, I think really influenced all the aspects of my life. And also just seeing like moment to moment, do I need to be stressed about this? Mm-hmm. Like, is it like a flower that's going to die inevitably? Like, is this a small moment or is this a big moment? Is it that important? So just that, that perspective, that whole passing fleeting moment thing. Mm-hmm. Is this something where you also now that you moved to after moving to Yokohama and discovered Ikebana, mm. I assume you discovered a community as well of uh, people practicing and enjoying that? Yeah, definitely. Um, just through, you know, work with the sensei, there's many uh, people in the classroom. Mm-hmm. So I've made friends through that and some connections. Um, I do feel... Um, a little bit of disconnect with being a foreigner, with teaching Ikebana. So it's mostly Japanese in the... Uh, in yeah, the... I would say mostly Japanese. But my my first teacher, um, it was a balance of Japanese and foreign students. Mm-hmm. And then she moved to Hokkaido. So That's far um, away. Yeah. It's your favorite since it's very <laughs> cold up there. Yeah. And then uh, last year I had to change to a different sensei. So I had to look around for senseis mm-hmm. and message senseis and like look at their style and stuff. And then I would say... Um, changes that is not too common. You try to avoid that. Um, so the transition from one sensei to another was really difficult mm-hmm. because their styles are, their styles and expectations were very different. And once you have the new sensei, you have to kind of adopt their style while maintain trying to find mm-hmm. your own and maintaining that. And then you have all the lessons to your other sensei, and maybe they don't like that. So that was a big moment. And for him, my current sensei, I'm probably his first. Uh, one of his first foreign students, so it's been a big, probably a challenge for him himself. Um, with what was one of the biggest changes for you then in that moment where you noticed you were doing Ikebana in a certain way before and the new sensei was like, no, oh, you can't do or shouldn't do um, I think the biggest thing was my um, previous sensei would always give a challenge and say so like, well, today you're working with this material or today you're going to do this theme. And um, she was very strict. For example, there's an arrangement where you don't have any support. Um, there's a kenzan, mm-hmm. which is the needles you stick the branches into for doing like uh, a arrangement called like moribana. Mm-hmm. And it's a flat dish. It's a round flat dish. And then, but there's arrangements that you have without that. And so you're just using the tension and balance of the branches and flowers to hold everything up. And so she said, okay, well, now that you've made it, like pick it up and walk around the room. And if it falls down, you fail. <laughs> so, yeah. and so you just it's walk like the game around. when you're a child and you walk yeah, with yeah. the egg and you don't have to. Yeah, so it. you just hold this walking around, you're like, uh, and the air conditioning, you're like, uh, and then start the air conditioning. And then you like put it down, it's still standing, you're like, ah, safe. Um, so they always have a challenge. And mm-hmm. with my new sensei, it's uh, come to class. And then again, I started with her as a student. And then I finished with her as the lowest level sensei. And then, or maybe second level. Um, and then I moved to this new sensei as a teacher. And so I just come and I have the flowers and I decide what I make myself. So he doesn't give me challenges. And stuff. Mm. So I have to be able to motivate myself and have those challenges for myself and decide what do I need to work on and what do I need to, what do I think I'm weak on? What do I want to do? What do I want to achieve? And so in that way it was very different and very hard to get used to. And so now I feel I'm much more used to it, but mm. it was a rough, it was a pretty rough six months transition. <laughs> With all the work you've done, I imagine you've also had quite a few exhibitions or places where uh, you you showed mm. your work. Is there any anywhere in particular that you have like a fond memory of that you, this was cool to have my flowers exhibited there? 
Um, I think my first exhibition, and I do it pretty much annually now, is at the Nihonbashi Takashimaya. Mm -hmm. And my first time exhibiting was during their 100th year anniversary. So that was oh, a pretty the, momentous the, occasion. The yeah. And a lot of like pressure that I put on myself. I always put a lot of pressure on myself um, more than anyone else, just mm -hmm. because I always do want to be my best, do my best and get better. Um, so I always put that pressure on me. So I'm like, well, 100th year anniversary, I got to do something great. And then every year I'm like, oh, I have to do something amazing. Um, it never stops. Every year there's a new one. Yeah, it never stops. So I always wanted every year try and do better. Mm -hmm. um, I would say like that's a big thing, but also just a simple thing. Um, going back to the daily life and how flowers can change people's lives is I would do um, the cabana arrangements in the toilets at, um, at my work and other works. Mm -hmm. And people would just comment, you're like, wow, going to the toilet was really nice. <laughs> I could just sit <laughs> there for a unexpected. moment. Yeah, I know, exactly. And like, like, I could just sit there for a moment and relax, just looking at the flowers. So even those small things of having an arrangement in the um, toilet, which I call toilet bana, instead of ikebana, toilet mm -hmm. bana. Toilet bana. And, um, that changes people's days, changes their perspective, gives them a moment of rest or replenishes their energy just a little bit through that day. So the impact flyers can have anywhere. Um, and that, that always comes back to me. Like, well, I got so many comments just from having flowers in the toilet. <laughs> and they're just like, it was just really nice. And they can reflect on it. They were taking pictures in the toilet. <laughs> just like, okay. maybe, we, maybe we need a toilet maybe, banner here. Yeah. yeah, that would be very nice. Um, so there's like big things like the exhibition that like hundreds or thousands of people will see. But then those small moments where people really appreciate those flowers and it really makes a difference in their day. And that's interesting because the, the two that really... Um, that you mentioned to me that had a big impact on you were well the toilet example just now <laughs> but also the Minecraft example yeah. which are like one person's life or a few people's lives have had a positive impact from your work and of course a lot of people have enjoyed the beautiful flowers mm. at the Takashimaya but you don't necessarily have the direct connection with the people seeing this and the direct feedback. No, not at all, yeah. Um, and I think for myself it's much more worthwhile having that connection and seeing mm. how it impacts people's lives. Um, I would say a lot of people, when they look at my arrangements, they would say it's always like dynamic. And I think that's because I always want to have a lot of expression. So when I make an arrangement, I have to like sit down, look at the flowers and say, what are these flowers saying to me? Mm -hmm. What can I do with these flowers? Are they flexible? Are they not flexible? What am I feeling? What do I want to express? Am I happy today? Sad today? What's on my mind? Mm. And like, that's what I want to express. So, so uh, an active meditation in a way. Very much so, yeah. There's mm. a lot of meditation and reflection. Um, because you can tell the difference between when people just kind of want to make something look pretty and in a vase and the difference when someone wants to say something and express something. So... Um, they say, like in their philosophy, like God made the flowers, mm -hmm. humans made the vases, and you can't have one without the other. And then once they're together, um, it's not just flowers, it's not just vases, it's ikebana, and it's a mm. whole, it's together. And so putting those elements together, yourself, the flowers, the vase, they all work with each other um, to say what you want to try and feel. So every time I make an arrangement, I really try to focus on that and do mm -hmm. that so it's not just about being looking nice and looking pretty is there um with all the things you've already done if you reach the level of master uh, no right let me rephrase this mm. when you reach the level <laughs> of master um what is it that you like to do that you are not able to do now maybe i think i would say i have not yet broken into making the huge arrangements like room size ones mm. that you might see um like the head of our sogetsi kebana she has herself and a whole team of like 10 people and they will make an arrangement that fills a whole room for or, like a convention hall or yeah like for the exhibition or for a hotel mm -hmm. for a car show for a mall um i would love to be involved with that but also I would love to eventually start teaching internationally. And so there's a lot of teachers who will go to um, different countries to share Ikebana. For example, mm -hmm. my sensei now, he's in China teaching. Um, okay. I know a Ikebana sensei in Singapore. He goes to India often. We have a couple of chapters mm -hmm. in India. Um, there's a very famous 
you'll say in Belgium, she's a wonderfully Gabbana teacher and she goes over Europe and America mm -hmm. around the world. So I like to be part of that community where I get to go to different countries and share my experience and share the Ikebana. That's, I think, one of the biggest goals. Yeah, because you're learning from the source, but you have the ability of uh, speaking English, of coming from an international yeah. background, and you have also the skill mm -hmm. of teaching, so you could export it, basically. Yeah, and it's a very niche um, niche customer base here in Japan because I have basically um, foreigners who want to learn Ikebana and then um, Japanese people who want to learn Ikebana but also speak in English mm -hmm. and learn English. So my... my um, My customer base is very niche. Yeah. And I, myself, I'm working on my Japanese. I've been here for a while. But talking about Ikebana philosophies, it's a bit above my head, yeah. uh, language-wise. Very so I specific can, vocabulary. Mm, so I can teach in um, a mix of English and Japanese. So any Japanese person who speaks a little English, we can get by. It's fine. Uh, but to teach just in Japanese, it's, that'd be really difficult for mm. me. Um, I can teach in English and French. But um, still the whole, you know, getting deep and down with that philosophy in Japanese I'm still above my yeah, ability. Yeah, it's a very, yeah. very tricky. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you think? Um, you said a lot of the, or a lot of Ikebana also has to do with the spirit of the moment. And mm. uh, that Sogetsu is very like living within the times. We just kind of came out of a very uh, difficult period for many of COVID and uh, more challenges happening around the world. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like This is also reflected in Ikebana, and if so, what kind of changes have you noticed maybe in recent years with the flower arrangements? Immediately what comes to mind, um, definitely during um, COVID, um, when we were during the uh, state of emergency in Japan, a lot of people would make um, COVID-themed Ikebana mm. just to represent um, what it looks like. Okay. Um, so it's like a visualization of, I don't know, like a yeah. monster or virus. Yeah, exactly. Flowers with the flowers, something that looks like the COVID, mm -hmm. the actual virus, or how it's affecting our society. So there, there was a lot of like, you know, impactful, sad arrangements, a lot of arrangements that look like COVID. Um, so that was very much on people's minds and that reflected mm -hmm. the Ikebana. And then um, during the Ukraine war, um, a lot of people are doing Ikebana to support that. Mm -hmm. And they have the blue and they use colors of blue and yellow. Uh, and so they would show their support through Ikebana. So it very much reflects the times that we go through. Um, during the Olympics, again, uh, Japan held the Olympics a couple of years ago. And there'd be Olympic themed Ikebana. So it really reflects what's going on mm -hmm. and with our time. And again, would there be scarcity in flowers? Well, don't use flowers. So going back to the founder of Ikebana, well, if there's just dirt, just use dirt. Um, so there's okay, have to be okay. flowers. So um, for Soka to at least, like, again, you can use anything and to express yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think that Ikebana is always going to reflect what's going on. And people are going to, people are always going to reflect what they feel. And so I think it is very um, common to see that reflection going on in the world mm -hmm. and that it'll always be changing um, especially with our style it's meant to be changed um, Ikebana has come such a long way from long ago with the monks doing seasonal arrangements for the gods to what we have today and then I think as time goes on we're going to see big changes and again for example global warming maybe there's not going to be as many flowers mm -hmm. available we don't know but Ikebana will show a way to express itself Because you're also using a lot of very seasonal mm. flowers. Yeah, Now, seasonal or mm. unseasonal. So In, yes, so. Um, the good thing about Ikebana is that, yes, we love celebrating the seasons and festivals, but we don't have to be attached to that anymore. Mm -hmm. mm. Now, with all the change happening and uh, your eight-year experience and your goals, What is a change that you'd like to see in Ikebana, maybe in the coming year or two mm. years? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very focused on learning myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I would just like to see it because with a lot of Japanese cultures with um, in Japan, I would say that a lot of Japanese people may not have that connection. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see having that more of that connection come back, but also sharing that around the world. So um, Sogetsu does a pretty good job of having international because it's so progressive anytime, anywhere, anyone. We have a lot of chapters around the world, mm -hmm. but I would still like to see more availability, uh, more people promoting it. Um, I like to see 
it is in Japan, it's in the schools and stuff, but it's just kind of there. And I would like to have more of a revival of it because flowers are supposed to be like your companion in Japan. Like they're with you every day mm -hmm. and we use them to celebrate a lot of occasions, yes. daily life. A store opening um, has usually a lot of flowers outside. It would be great mm -hmm. if Ikebana could help promote um, more awareness of our um, ecology and environment. Um, because again, if we ruin our environment, we're not going to have flowers. So maybe more of a push for that. So that will be the biggest challenge, climate change. And I how think so, because is. that's a huge issue mm. to our lives, to living, um, to say the least. But mm. of course, it's going to directly impact Ikebana. Thank you very <laughs> much, Daniel. We talked a lot about Sorry, your journey yeah. a little bit and uh, your, uh, your experience learning and what Ikebana is. We didn't dive too much into the details of for them, which flowers you use and maybe some specific vocabulary. Uh, but do you feel like there's anything that we haven't talked about today that is important for mm. you to mention that you would like people to know about Ikebana? I'm just trying to think <laughs> because we did cover a lot, but yeah. there is so much more to cover. Yes, there I is. could go on for probably hours about it. And again, I'm still learning myself mm -hmm. and I have much more to learn, but I have a lot to share too. Um, I would just say that don't be afraid to try. And if you've been thinking about it, give it a go. Um, experiment at home with the flowers that you have. And if you like it, maybe seek out trying mm -hmm. to learn some more. So I would just say don't be afraid to experiment with the flowers and um, feel free to try and find someone um, to teach you if you want to do that. And again, there's chapters around the world for Sogetsu and there's lots, lots and lots of options in Japan. Um, so I would just say work with nature and um, if you feel like that's going to bring you towards Ikebana, like please go ahead and try. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> if people want to see your work, where can they find some of your uh, images um, of arrangements and uh, resources? Well, conveniently next week, the October 28th, 29th, and 30th at the Nihonbashi Takashimaya, mm -hmm. I'll be presenting there. Um, but I put all of my work on my Instagram, which is star.river.ikebana. Mm -hmm. We will link everything yes, in you. the description. Um, the and Instagram and Twitter is where you can see my work. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if people are curious in the Yokohama area, um, they can reach out to you. Have yeah. a chat to me about it. And then whether I can be available to be their teacher i can refer them to someone else well thank you very much this was very interesting i'm <laughs> sure you. we could have continued to talk more um about ikebana because uh yeah it's, it's a very broad topic very it's historical deep. It can topic. be deep and um but thank you <laughs> thank you for giving us an insight and uh, hopefully opening the doors to a few listeners um this was it for yeah, today's episode thank you for coming all <laughs> the way you. This was Fish and Rice, stories from Japan. Thank you for listening. Thank, Thank you, you for watching and we'll see you next week. Bye.